what I'm going to do is uh, talk in a slightly general way, but with very elementary examples about graphics for uncertainty. The thing is, we live in a world which is absolutely full of what we now call visualizations. We just used to call them graphics. And uh, infographics. And uh, a lot of them are, are, are really well done. My brother, who is not a statistician, sent me an email the other day saying, have you seen this? What a great way to present data this is. And he sent me the link. So I'm going to show it to you. I had hoped to show you a different example, um, but you know, one thing about graphics is you have to be ready to adapt to the lighting conditions in the room. You're never going to see that one. I would rather have talked about refugee movement across the world, but what I, I'm going to talk about instead is arms sales across the world because they're in much brighter colors. <laughs> now, this is a video which starts from the 1950s, and it's uh, uh, by a gentleman called um, Will Geary. And uh, what it does is, is animate uh, by looking at the, here we go, the patterns of sales just by the US and by Russia to different countries across the world. And uh, this is going to animate right through to the present day, and uh, it's quite uh, fun to look at. Now, uh, there may be all sorts of critiques that you would wish to make of this. First of all, it's only selecting out two countries, and that's only about 50% of the arms sales in the world. It's basically, I suppose, a big table which tells us one country uh, sending, another country receiving, but it's been presented, of course, on the map, and that's very helpful. Uh, the precise locations of these little packets of arms is, of course, completely spurious, but it helps you think about these arms flying across the world. Um, and, and whatever you think of it, it's the one that my brother uh, phoned up and said, you must look at this. This is really interesting. So uh, the simple point that I'd like to make is that there are people out there who uh, spend their professional lives developing means of communication, and perhaps sometimes there are things that we might usefully pick up and learn. And I think there's one or two things which are readily available to us, which, in my view, are underused, and I'd like to, to talk about those. However, it's also based not just on the data. By the way, uh, your, uh, arms did not stop in 2017, but that's just when the data ran out. Uh, it's also true that uh, many d visualizations are just about the data, but one might say that the uh, added value that we bring as statisticians is the model, the inference, the conclusions, and so we ought to be thinking about the, uh, and we do, think about the uncertainty that's associated with all of that. Now, uh, the paper, uh, my paper for tonight's discussion meeting, uh, was prepared, if those of you use LaTeX, it used the Animate package, and it means that uh, if you uh, embed figures, the figures, when you click on them online, will actually animate. And many of you might be familiar with that. I think that's a device we should use much more routinely. I had been hoping that we would get this through to, so the online version of the paper would be, allow you to do that, but I'm afraid the process by which the paper is prepared uh, it doesn't. But uh, may I encourage us all to use this facility, which means you have a PDF, which when you click on the paper, it, it does something. You click on the image, it does something. Now, I don't know how well you can see this. I'm going to blow up uh, the top part of it, but I, I'm going to focus on two things. One is sh color shading, very elementary, color shading and animation. And uh, what I'm going to do is explain uh, how we might represent a distribution. And here is a set of data which I'm going to show to you. And rather than just show you tables of numbers, I'm going to show you one at a time. And what we'll do is just uh, have a little smudge as each data point uh, appears. And uh, if you look very closely, and you might see it uh, more carefully in a moment, above is a little record of the data, a little imprint of the data. And it, just think of this as a shoe, which is a bit of ink on it. And that shoe is uh, being pressed down at various positions on this real line, but it's leaving behind an inky smudge. And what's emerging is a picture of the distribution of the data. Now, I have to say immediately, uh, when I, I thought of this some years, I thought, what a great idea that is. And then, of course, you realize someone else has already thought of it. So Chris Jackson, in a paper on the American Statistician in 2008, developed this as a means of, of displaying distributions, which I think is, is considerably underused. But the thing is that uh, while we know and love uh, our box plots and other means of uh, expressing variation in data, 
Those who are not statistically trained may get a different message. This is very precise with the box ends. And uncertainty is fuzzy, it's unpredictable. And so a little bit of indication of that, I think, uh, merits uh, in the communication uh, exercise. Now, I need to counter that immediately by saying density strips are certainly not the answer to all our problems. The one might say the distribution, the idea of a distribution, is one of the absolutely key concepts in, uh, in statistics and doing inference. But uh, density strips are pretty good at saying it's over here, it's not over here they are much less good at showing the detail. So if you really want to see the detail of things, you probably want a different device. But to link to a paper in 2010 that was read to the uh, Royal Statistical Society at the start of a 10-year statistical literacy campaign, Chris Wilde's paper talked about staying in the same visual space as the data. So rather than add in density functions or so on, the density strip has a very um, uh, important role in keeping us just within the plot and we see where the distribution is and where it isn't. Really elementary example. I'll leave the details of the context of the data uh, to the paper where they're described. Uh, this is looking at uh, a set of data which is a change score before and after an operation. We're looking at asymmetry and the green line, if you can see it, is it, are the, is it possible to bring the lights any further? Um, no, maybe not for the camera, I realize now. Um, there's a green line in there which is showing the mean of the data and there's a red line at zero which is the reference point. Now most of us would be unimpressed by a difference of that size, but how do we express our uncertainty? Well, why don't we just show the distribution? Never mind uh, confidence interval with its sharp end points which encourages us to think algorithmically, is it inside, is it outside, but just show the distribution. And from a Bayesian perspective, uh, that's um, a sim simple thing to think about from a frequentist perspective. This is really something that's equivalent to the usual pivotal function argument for constructing a confidence interval uh, or a t-test or whatever, but it's just really showing the t-distribution scaled by the standard error uh, in, in a graphical uh, manner. And of course, one could attach that to the reference value. And there we see now wh how the data, the green line, compares to the reference with its uncertainty about where the mean might be. Two samples, well, um, again, uh, there's a little density strip running behind here, by the way, which is of the data just to separate out the two groups. But our standard error of the difference and the uh, associated distribution is the, the reference which we can use to assess the size of any difference. Where do we put it? Well, I've stuck it here against the mean of the larger group and uh, there's a little scale, a different scale there, which helps us assess not only that it's far from zero, but also what the plausible size of the differences are. So very elementary uh, use of these devices. Here is um, two-way analysis of variance. We don't do analysis of variance terribly often these days, uh, but uh, nonetheless, uh, here's an example where I think it's relevant. Um, which is comparing three different sites at which uh, sulfur dioxide measurements on a log scale have been taken. It's from a European monitoring site. We'll look at it later. And we've also got different years reflected. And it's pretty obvious there are differences between the sites. Pretty obvious, if you look carefully, that there are diff likely to be differences between the years. So here's a model which is additive. It has both those effects present. But it is in potential competition with an interaction model, which allows the uh, fitted values to shift a little. Are they shifting enough to make that um, a, a model that's needed in the, with the interaction present? Well, of course, what we usually do is we go to an F statistic or something equivalent, and we think about residual sums of squares maybe. I mean, the beauty of the linear model theory is that we can also formulate that as a comparison of fitted values. And that has a big advantage. We stay within the space of the plot. We can show things as fitted values. And actually, what I'm going to do is just rewrite the F statistic, explicitly focusing on the difference between the fitted values of the two models, the Y hats under each model. And then what appears is the thing which tells us what we might use in our measure of uncertainty, there's the interaction model, here is now the additive model in comparison, but with the uncertainty added on. 
And the uncertainty is not a confidence interval for the mean, it's not a multiple comparisons. It's taking the component of the F statistic, which is the thing that we might globally use to analyze the data. And so it's trying to make a direct link between the analysis we do and the image that we project. And the, the sort of conceptual idea is where these things match up, where the red line is in, in a green bit, uh, that's a good match, and where it's not, it isn't. And as, uh, as we look around the space here, we can see there's sufficient number of cases where the match is not so good uh, that we might doubt whether the additive model is good enough. If you really want to, you could even do the p-value that way, but let's, uh, let's skate on from that. Another elementary example. Very famous set of data on uh, the, which, a uh, very famous paper, I should say, which identified the, the statistical link between lung cancer and smoking. You probably all know it from many decades ago. The main focus was on men, and there were uh, cases and controls who were other hospital patients who didn't have lung cancer. The interest was, did they smoke or did they not? Well, there's also a little data set in there about women, and this is it. So it's a table. Um, those of you who are familiar with mosaic graphics will uh, be familiar with the idea that you can use the areas to reinforce the message about the size of the counts here. But actually, on the left-hand side, you probably can't see it terribly well, is a proportion scale. So it allows us to see cases proportion, controls proportion. Are they far enough apart that there is a, a, a real evidence of a difference? Or is it plausible? within the limits of variation that uh, those two groups actually have the same underlying proportion. Well, of course, we'd go to the, um, the paper, went to the chi-squared statistic. Again, I'm just going to rewrite that as a difference between the fitted values, the values which allow the proportions to be different, the values which, the model which forces the proportions to be the same. And then that suggests how we might express the uncertainty in the denominator of that component uh, again, I'm just going to do a little smudge, that, that idea that we have uncertainty without going into the technical detail of uh, how we might deal with it, to see that the red lines simply don't match up with the green terribly well. Now, if we're dealing with an audience which is, who is not statistically trained and, frankly, not terribly interested in the technical detail or have the, 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 the means of accessing the technical details, I think there is some merit in doing that, but it is important to do it in ways which are consistent with the formal analysis that might be taking place behind. There is an example on regression, excuse me, in the paper, which I think I will leave you to read and skate on to ask this question. If you have a surface, and this is closer to some of the uh, earlier speakers, um, Matteo, if you have a surface, how do you express the uncertainty in it? Well, uh, here is a surface. Again, I'll skate over the details of the origin of it, but there are two covariates, and there are actually spatial covariates here, and a response. And I I'm going to skate over the first attempt to answer the question I've posed, and I'm going to go to this one. This is a, a non-parametric regression, essentially, of uh, how the mean changes over these two covariates. How do you express the uncertainty in that point estimate? Well, I think a much overlooked uh, solution is simply to animate. Here we have a draws from the, if you like, the posterior distribution, if you take that point of view. Alternatively, if you want to stick with the kind of frequentist view, you're exploring the space of the collection of fitted values by simulation. You could even think of it as a model-based bootstrap. But all we're really doing is taking draws which reflect the uncertainty and then animating between those draws to express the range of shapes that are compatible with the underlying shape of the surface. And actually, you've got to be a little bit careful in the way you do that interpretation, because if you just take a weighted average of this draw and the next draw, then the bits in between actually are, do not have the same marginal distribution anymore. So a very simple device of choosing appropriate weights we can make sure that the intermediate positions and have a smooth transition through this space, the intermediate transitions also have the same, uh, have the proper marginal distribution. Okay, really elementary stuff. Spatiotemporal data, um, that's ubiquitous nowadays. When, a few years ago, I looked around and said, there must be good tools for uh, just displaying data which is indexed over space and time in ways which allow you to explore it. I couldn't really find any at the time. Now, that's a, that's a prompt for at least half a dozen people to come up at the end of the meeting and, and tell me about all the tools that are out there. But um, I decided to have a go. 
at, at writing one, which is in the R panel package, which is a, a means of adding buttons and sliders and so on. So here is spatial data. It's SO2 over Europe. And you probably can't see very much of this, but at the top, if you look, go to the, um, the animations associated with the paper, you'll see that there's a, a moving window, which just using a slider, we can track through time and view interactively the spatial position of these elementary, uh, of these um, positions. However, it might be more informative, if we do it the other way, in this setting it might be clearer, and what we have here is a little probe, a little circle. Now this is an idea that goes back to the 1980s when people talked about brushing and, and so on, but it, it's, I think this is a setting where it's particularly uh, valuable. We can uh, probe the left-hand plot and just move the mouse around, and what we see over here is the time series, essentially, or the time pattern for the plots within that probe. And what we observe is largely, a good news, a decreasing SO2 with time at most places all around Europe. So, simple devices for plotting data. But uh, what about the uncertainty? Well, uh, it would be a really simple set of spatial data that only had space and, time, space and time. There are inevitably going to be other covariates involved. We will need a more sophisticated model. What I've fitted here is an additive model which allows terms for space, two-dimensional, for time, and allows seasonal effects which are almost always going to be present in environmental data. And what's presented here is one of the interactions. It's a three-way interaction which is beginning to get quite complicated. And we have uh, space, two dimensions, and then what we're going to do is just animate over month. And the colors, color is very important. Uh, when I first started, like everybody else, I suppose, you choose the brightest colors you can think of. Bad idea. There are lots of good papers out there on choice of colors, and this is, these are, if you can see them, are colors which are intended to, um, to indicate the contrast with zero as white in, in the middle. And so what this is doing is illustrating the interaction term which is the adjustment one would make to a simpler additive model in order properly to track the data. Uh, perhaps I'll show you that, that again, uh, because what I'd like to draw attention to are the contours, uncertainty. We can see the surface. What about its uncertainty? Is there evidence that this adjustment is really needed? Well, a simple device would simply would put on the contours, which measure how far away that surface is from zero in units of standard errors. And so the blue contours, two, three, four, five, give a graphical indication that yes, those terms really are necessary to capture what's going on. Um, the, I should also say that uh, those kinds of tools um, I know are in use by other people. This is uh, an example by GWS that Wayne Jones, who's present, uh, has been uh, very active in producing a tool which uses groundwater with a similar kind of, of tools and devices. And of course, our Shiny now, for those of you who are familiar with that, uh, is a very helpful device for um, enabling us to use these tools more readily. So, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>